Well, Dickie, thank you so much for joining me here today on the highest level and uh, excited to talk about your NBA career and experiences playing. But before we get to that, I want to take you back to your college days and you played at Providence College during a time where uh, they were really uh, kind of on the come up uh, as a program in their winning ways under coach Rick Barnes. And so just take me back to that time when you went to Providence in uh, the early 1990s and um, kind of the evolution of that team through your time there as a college student. Yeah, I, decided, I chose Providence because um, I always, I grew up in the Washington DC area and I always watched Big East and ACC basketball. So as a young kid, I said I was going, my goal and dream was to go play in um, one of those conferences, the Big East or the ACC. When I was coming up, obviously Georgetown was good. Um, you know, Maryland was good. The ACC was at a high level. Big East was at a high and physical level. So that's all I knew. And uh, as I started to evolve as a basketball player, and started to get to the point where, you know, you had to start putting together your criteria, what was important for um, a college or university to be a student athlete that one of the biggest things for me was I wanted to go somewhere and make a name for myself, go somewhere and help be a part of building um, success and building winning. So I wasn't, you know, I wanted to kind of uh, make my own way. Uh, so to speak. So that was the kind of mentality I had. And like you said, Providence was um, starting to be on the come up. Not that they hadn't won before or not that they hadn't had uh, very good talent before, but it, they had just got to another phase of just going to the final four with Rick Pitino. And then Rick Pitino left and Rick Barnes uh, became the coach. Um, when I got there, he was there for like two years before I arrived. Yeah, I went to the NCAA tournament. And so that's what led me, that was the main thing that led me to Providence, that the fact that I could make my own way, make a name for myself. And it was all about Providence basketball in that town. Providence basketball was like the NBA of the city. And we played downtown. You didn't have to compete with a football team. Um, and I was going to be in the Big East and be on TV. Yeah, and like you said, you know, the team had had really good success towards the end of the 80s. Um, and during your time there, there was a, a constant growth um, in, in your four years that you were at Providence. So just kind of talk about, uh, was it an influx of talent uh, that kind of caused you guys to, in your senior year, win the Big East tournament? Was it something that Coach Barnes was building within the culture that was slowly growing from year to year? What, what would, did, would you remember from that time? Well, when we came in my freshman year in 1990, we were that recruiting class. I remember they called us the new kids on the block. They did an article on us in, uh, in Providence paper. I remember that was when the music group New Kids on the Block was uh, kind of around. They called us the new kids on the block. And we came in, I want to say, the third or fourth ranked recruiting class that year behind Duke, North Carolina, and Kansas. I think we might have been number four, number five, somewhere right there. So we came in with a lot of expectations and all of us had kind of, that group that came in, Mike Smith, Rob Felch from Brooklyn, New York, Franklin Weston from uh, Queens, New York, Troy Brown from Massachusetts, myself, um, we kind of had already seen each other and played against each other somewhere along the roads of the grassroots grassroots as we were coming up. So we, it was a lot of expectations. And I think, you know, we came in at a time when Coach Barnes was, you know, three years into being a head coach. And so he was in the process of learning himself, you know, how to develop as a head coach, how to lead as a head coach. So um, there was a lot of trial and error. There was a lot of, uh, you know, ups and downs. There were a lot of challenging moments that, we endured our freshman year and our sophomore year um, that wasn't always uh, wasn't always the best, but it was uh, it was because we were a group that came in together. We hung in there together, so it made us like a family to fight through those difficult times and to appreciate the good times. So, like our freshman year, we played with Eric Murdoch. 
we had just missed the NCAA. We felt like we got snubbed in the NCAA tournament. My sophomore year, we started off good, but then we lost in Maui. And we had a very challenging sophomore year, dreadful sophomore year. So I would say that we had a lot, we had a group of talent that was able to grow together and go through the good and the bad. And our maturation process got us to the point where our junior and then into our senior year, we were clicking on all cylinders, you know. Um, and that's how it is sometimes. You would, you know, we wanted to be clicking on all cylinders as a freshman, as freshman in college, but it just doesn't work like that. And obviously the Big East was <laughs> very, a uh, very difficult challenge for transitioning into the college basketball. At the end of the day, I always say it's the long game. And you don't see it always at the beginning. But the long game paid off because we stuck together as brothers, as a family. We grew. We understood. We went through some challenging times. And then junior year, we started climbing up the mountain. And senior year, we peaked at a high, at that high level of what the expectations were. And that's what got us to the success of winning a Big East championship. Yeah, and, and I, I'm glad that you said that because I, I think that's what makes sports so so special a lot of times is that camaraderie that you get with your teammates and the people that you're going to battle with day to day. Uh, and obviously, college <laughs> the college landscape's changing a lot right now. Um, guys are transferring, uh, you know, after a year or two at a place, and you don't get quite the same type of patience that you just described, and kind of going through those hard times, and then coming out on the other side and and having that success. And so, you know, I'm sure that was a huge piece to to the success that you guys experienced at Providence during that time. Absolutely, I mean. You know, obviously we're in different times, like you just mentioned. More transfers, the transfer portal is like the free agency of college basketball. Back then, guys weren't transferring like that. In my four years at Providence, we had two guys transfer the four years I was there. And, uh, you know, we withstood the challenges, the adversity, the difficult time as brothers and pulling for each other and pushing each other and fighting through. And, uh, um, you know, just that bond together is so important. People don't realize that bond together, being together with somebody, some guys for four years, you grow to know each other, you become family, you do whatever it takes to help each other. But at the end of the day, you know, I go back to the meeting that we had that I, a meeting that I called in the locker room before we went to the Big East tournament and we were on a roll. And Coach Wands was one of the hottest coaches in college basketball. So we knew his name was being mentioned in the Clemson job. It was being mentioned in other jobs, but heavily in the Clemson job. And so at the end of the day, I called a meeting and talked to the guys and just told them, hey, you know, Coach Barnes is leaving. He's going to go where the money is. I mean, that's what this business is about. And that if I knew that all the guys that were coming back were worried about who was going to be the next coach, should they stay, should they transfer, what is it going to look like? And what I told them is at the end of the day, winners is what it's all about. People want winners. So we go and continue to win. You'll have us, all the options that you could imagine because you're a winner. You could stay here, you could go somewhere else, but people want winners and that will help you navigate your next move when when coach Barnes is not here as the coach anymore and so winning was the key for the boss uh for the Big East tournament and winning as a team um you know I just told him we win as a team you're going to win as an individual at the end of the day yeah, a hundred percent. And sometimes, it, you know, those uh, moments, I don't want to say of crisis, I don't want to be too dramatic, but sometimes when we have those moments of adversity, it kind of brings everybody back together. And like you said, you guys were able to, to come together right before the Big East tournament and win that tournament um, and do exactly what you said at the beginning of our uh, uh, interview, have, have the success that you desired and kind of set yourself apart uh, on your own path at Providence. And this led you directly to 
being drafted in the first round by the Chicago Bulls. Uh, and this is just after they had had their first three Pete. Uh, Michael Jordan has left the team. So just kind of talk about walking in to the world champion Chicago Bulls organization, uh, but without kind of this player that we all looked up to growing up. Uh, what was that experience like for you as a, a rookie? Um, it was it was surreal. It was um, it was, uh, you know, obviously being drafted in the NBA was a dream come true. And obviously the Chicago Bulls had a brand that was international at that time. And to be drafted by the Chicago Bulls, it was like, wow, that's amazing. And then and then you start seeing that, you know, MJ wasn't going to be there. And so now it's like, what the, the, the life after MJ? And it's like, you know, you're coming to the Bulls, no MJ, they just came off a uh, three-peat and what's the next step? And again, it's kind of like when I went to Providence, you know, now it's like everybody's trying to figure out what will the Chicago Bulls be? That's an opportunity to come in and, you know, show what you can do and be a part of the new era. And so it was interesting. Um, when I got there, there was a lot of stories told to me about the difference when MJ was there and when he wasn't. And then crazy enough, uh, my rookie season in the early parts, you know, who would have thought MJ decides that he wants to come back and he's starting to practice with us in December and we have to keep it under wraps and not let people know. And so the more he practiced with us, the more it seemed like it was going to be a reality. And so my, the thought of when I was drafted and there was going to be no MJ and a different looking Bulls turned into, you know, month and a half into the, my rookie season being, oh, MJ's coming back. So it was, it was a, it was an interesting roller coaster ride of, of, uh, you know, being in the moment, you know, um, and believe me, once he came back, uh, the rock band, the circus, and everything, atmosphere started to circle around the organization and the team so it was like night and day seeing the difference between the attention without MJ and the attention when he came back so it was a lot being thrown at me as a as a rookie and it was it was it was interesting it was interesting yeah. Yeah, of course. I can only imagine the attention uh, shot up uh, dramatically once he uh, kind of was rumored to be coming back. Y you talked about everybody telling you about what it was like before MJ, and you got this interesting uh, insight into the, the organization for a few months, your rookie year without him, but then him starting to come back and practice with the team and ulti ultimately rejoining the team. What were you noticing about maybe either the feel within the locker room or the culture? Um, just like, what do you remember about kind of like the change that was occurring within the team specifically? It was an instant change in the presence and the environment and the mentality of when he wasn't there when I first got there to when he first stepped back in the gym. You could see the instant change. It was like a snap of the finger where another level of intensity went up, another level of competitiveness went up, um, another level of responsibility and understanding how important your role is and to do your job. All those things went up. I mean, it just, it was like instant, instant change. Not that not that uh, we weren't focused on our roles and weren't focused on competing and weren't focused on being intense before he got there. It was that it went from, you know, one level to zero to a hundred in an instance, you know? And so his presence, you could see how powerful um, his leadership, his competitiveness, um, you know, his just focus on on winning, changed the environment, changed the mentality, changed the process instantly. You know, one thing one, one thing that's funny is we were we were flying charter. We were flying charter on um, a regular plane, like a regular 757 plane. We would fly charter. And uh, I remember the I remember as soon as he 
uh, got back and he was getting ready to play in it with us. We switched from that regular 757 to custom luxury, luxury private planes. So <laughs> that's one example of how things changed overnight. <laughs> One small example, but very emblematic of uh, kind of the stuff that you guys were were taking, um, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in in this first year, he comes back. Obviously, the the huge media circus. I can remember it as a young teenager, just kind of like the obvious excitement around him returning to the game, and and kind of the the second half of that season. And you guys lose in the playoffs to Orlando. And this was kind of seen as the young team that was kind of uh, the next team to, to really maybe have a chance in the Eastern Conference was this young duo of Penny Hardaway and Shaq. You guys lose to them. Uh, and, it, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'd love to hear from your perspective. But you talked at Providence how you guys kind of came together in the last two years of your time at Providence. Did you feel that that was that adversity of losing to Orlando and maybe hearing them being the next the next team in the Eastern Conference? Do you think that had any effect leading into the next season where this becomes one of the great teams? Uh, just talk about how that adversity led into the 95 season. Well, at the end of the day, it was another instant change in the process of getting to winning a title. You know, when people talk about leadership, when they talk about leaders on a team, you know, um, most of the time when I see guys, they they they're only leaders when it's good, but they're not leaders when it's when it's bad or when it's challenging. And the one thing I can say, it was another level of uh, increased focus and intensity of that never happening again, and that was because. You know, MJ took ownership on how we lost in that series. I mean, I think if you remember, uh, Nick Anderson kind of stole the ball from MJ in that little stretch and we lose that series. He took ownership as our leader and basically set the tone that that would never happen again. And I think from a leadership standpoint, I mean, that's the biggest thing. There was no point in fingers. There was no excuses. It was... This won't ever, it was, this won't ever happen again. Embrace this pain, embrace this disappointment, embrace this loss, but it won't happen again. And then you have another gear. We go into another gear where the leader, MJ, sets the tone over the off season and into the next season that we're getting back to the finals. And it just took us to another level of drive, focus, and, uh, and I think that is what was the biggest difference of going into that 95, 96 season and then getting the best record ever at that time in the NBA and winning the finals. That moment in Orlando, losing that series with our leader taking ownership and saying it would never happen again was a defining moment for the next three championships. Yeah. <clears throat> I love that. And I mean, we, we just saw this in the NFL where a, a head coach was fired for, for basically uh, absolving himself of any mistakes or, or responsibility of mistakes. So I love the fact that even though he's the best player, he's the one admitting his own mistakes and kind of putting his ego aside for the betterment of the team. Talk about your own development at this period in time, because you're, you're playing with one of the best ever, but let's face it, the best of all time. And you're also playing under one of the greatest coaches of all time. So talk about how you evolved as a player and developed uh, coming in as a first round pick, but, but playing with all these great players that you played with. Well, my, my development and my learning has always been majority visual, visual visual and experience, just watching, um, evaluating um, players, coaches, the best player. That has always been my process for continuous development. So, you know, just, just seeing MJ and just uh, paying attention to feel on how he coached and dealt with the team and the direction was the, the biggest part of my development process then showing the veteran players that I'm willing to put in the work uh, to do my role, understand my role, and, and, and hopefully 
my role is valued where I can show it on the court. Um, so that was kind of how my process went. And, it, and it's interesting because we start off that 95, 96 season. Um, bef- you know, before we start this season, we make the trade for Dennis Rodman. And so, you know, I'm kind of figuring, trying to figure out what, what's my process now. Um, because I know he's brought in here for us to have another veteran piece to get to the championship. That's a part of the business. How does that play for me? Uh, and what's interesting is when the season started, uh, Dennis got hurt. And so he was out for a month and a half, I want to say almost two months. And Phil, you know, it wasn't any lead up to it. It wasn't any come talk to me and tell me anything. It was just the next game, Phil was like, you're starting. And then I got an opportunity to start that whole time while he was hurt. Um, I felt like my process of visualizing the veterans, the leadership, watching coach, understanding my role helped me be prepared. And I felt like I did what I was supposed to do, did what I needed to do, and didn't hurt um, our goal and our process and was effective on the court and gained respect and gained uh, the respect from my teammates and and those guys always trying to make sure they help me in different moments of the game, practice, and continue to do what I need to do in my role. Because believe me, MJ was going to make you understand you better do your role (laughs) for us to win. So that was a great moment. And I thought that my process and development helped me be prepared for that moment. And uh, I did what what I needed to do in that season. Yeah, I love hearing that. I mean, the the accepting the role is an understated piece when we're talking about like great teams and championship teams. You specifically, you're you've had all the success in college. You're a first round draft pick, um, and then to have you know someone like Dennis Rodman, who's a great player, come in. A lot of times, players maybe look inwards and and think like you said, what does this mean for me? Uh, am I now about to be, you know, an afterthought? Uh, was there anything that Phil Jackson was doing during this time to kind of uh, make you understand your role or maybe accept your role? Or do you kind of maybe put look back at maybe former coaches or the way that you were raised that kind of helped you deal with that? I think it was more the way I was raised by my mother and just my mentality of, understanding about winning and you know had being an experience being in experiences where I've won and I've been a leader and understanding that when I was a leader I had to get team members to understand their role for us to have the ultimate goal and how the success would trickle down to every but the team success would trickle down to everybody individually so my experiences were more of what help me try to maximize my role and you know it's just it's natural for humans to think about ourselves first or think about how this affects me you know I mean that's natural I, I think you know you should be able to do that but at the end of the day once you have gone through that processing you have to circle back and get back to um understanding and embracing. I always say, know your role, embrace your role, and star your role at the end of the day. Know your role, and you know your role by asking the leadership, what is my role? What do I need to do? Walk away from that and get yourself in a mindset where you can embrace that role. And then once you've embraced that role, now you go and star in that role on the court. Whatever that role is, everybody has to have a role on the team. And so feel helped me to understand what my role was a little bit, but it wasn't hard for me to to pick that up. I mean, he didn't have to talk to me or tell me what my role was at a a long extent. I knew what my role was. Get in there, rebound, play defense. Uh, You get an opportunity to score, finish around the basket, run the offense, make the plays, and at the end of the day, get out of the way and let MJ do his thing. So so it wasn't wasn't difficult. Good recipe for success right there. Absolutely. You don't, you don't, you don't need to overdo anything to mess that recipe <laughs> up. So, so I think me being a mature college, well, me being a more 
mature college player playing four years and what I was taught from the foundation built by my mother helped me to, you know, get past worrying about my individual self and doing what was necessary in my role for helping us win. Yeah, I love this. And, and I want to come back to this later on because uh, I know you work as a scout and uh, I'm sure there's pieces of this that you're looking for in players today, right? Like the, the balance between um, the maturity, uh, but also the talent. Uh, and, and I know you, you won two championships with Chicago uh, and then you ended up on the Three. Golden State. Three. Oh, we're going to get there. But yes, oh, okay. but you, won, yeah, yeah, you won two. Uh, right, and then right, you ended right. up at Golden State beginning the 98 season. And uh, just kind of talk about the difference in culture, uh, because you're coming from the, the very best at the time in the NBA, and you're going to a different organization. Was there much of a culture shock for you, or was it pretty similar to what you had experienced in Chicago in terms of the team and, and the feeling around the team? It was night and day in culture. Uh, you had one culture led by the best player that ever played the game. So that culture led by that player, led by that coach, arguably one of the best coaches to coach the game, that culture was set with a bunch of veterans that knew how to play, knew what they needed to do, and followed the leader that was worthy of following and was respected. Then you flip on the other side of the spectrum, that culture was young players, players that had kind of migrated there in the latter part of their careers. So it was like more older players and more younger players. It wasn't really a lot in the middle. And the leader who was Freewell, um, didn't have the same mentality as a leader like MJ. Um, so their, his approach was different, night and day approach. And, you know, uh, him being a leader, whether he wanted to or not, his leadership affected the culture. And Carlissimo was the coach. And the way he, the way his leadership skills were affected the culture at the end of the day. So you had MJ and Phil Jackson, you had Carlissimo and, and, and Sprewell. And at the end of the day, you saw the way those two turned out. MJ and uh, Phil Jackson, championships. Sprewell and Carlissimo, Sprewell chokes Carlissimo. So, in a dysfunctional environment. So I got to see both sides of the spectrum. Um, and it was by my, you know, by my choice, because you talk about roles and I felt like you know, and this is a part of life. This is a part of where you have to make decisions in your in your in your process of where you want to go in life. And I felt like we had won two championships, and it was time for me to find a place where I could have an expanded role. And so that place ended up being Golden State, where they, you know, when they say the grass is not always green on the other side, that is actually true. Uh, but the good thing is, I think the good thing and the best thing about it was. The two, two, those two championship years and my three years at that point in time in Chicago, I take it that the way I went about my role, the way I went about my business was valued because at the end of the day, Golden State ends up waving me, letting me go. And my agent calls me like a week later and says, Jerry Krause called me and said, Phil, and MJ wants you back there. So I, I took that as, that was uh, that was powerful right there. That meant that when I was there, I did what I was supposed to do. And even though I wanted to go try to expand my role, I didn't leave on bad terms. Um, and, and, and it told me that my role and my approach and my business mindset and my mentality, and I guess my skill set, um, was valued for them to want me back there in the process of getting to that third championship. So, you know, it's, I don't know what the analogy or the words you use for that, but it's like, 
I don't know if you say the perfect storm or whatever, but things find a way of playing out if you go about your business the right way and you you do your job at a high level. People respect that, and uh, that's what happened. Yeah, I can't think of a higher compliment than the the greatest player and the greatest coach of all time uh, requesting to have you back on the team, knowing that that you're a key ingredient to to those championships. I, I think that speaks a lot to not only the type of player that you were, but but also your character. Um, and just kind of talk about maybe some of the unseen traits that we don't see from some of those leaders inside the locker room. Obviously, we're aware of, of what they do on the court, but was there anything unseen or intangible that you noticed uh, just overall in your time at Chicago? Well, I think one, one thing I saw Phil Jackson be great at, which I felt like, I had that ability to being a leader in high school, being a leader on my college basketball team. But seeing Phil Jackson do it took my my own ability to another level. You know, when we talk about the development of a leader, development of a leader and watching other leaders help develop leaders. Watching Phil Jackson, he had an unbelievable knack and skill of managing personalities and egos. Um, and I thought he was very good at that. Um, now, obviously, when you're a leader in the sports realm and you have the best player who is a leader of the players respect you and you're both on the same vibe, that adds even extra value to your leadership. You know, so the fact that MJ had unbelievable respect for Phil Jackson is, is going to make all the players on the team respect. Phil Jackson, you know, because, you know, everybody's going to respect Jay, you're going to respect Phil, and there's going to be a high level of respect across the board for everybody. So I watched Phil manage different personalities from MJ's intense, competitive fire. Um, it wasn't winning is everything. It was winning is the only thing. Um, I watched him manage D Rod's eccentric personality uh, and be able to blend all those together and manage Scotty's personality um, and blend them all together and still manage everybody else around. So I thought that was a big key. And then the one thing about MJ that I had already known and I had already learned from my mother. And just growing up and just watching and being faced and being put in the situations where you're going to be faced in life. But watching MJ, even though I knew this, watching him took it to another level. And again, I'm a, I'm a visual learner and I'm watching these leaders. And this is the one thing that's never really discussed at the end of the day from a leadership standpoint is MJ only aired on one side. And in life, you have a decision to make. Either you want to be respected or you want to be liked. MJ was going to end the day with you respecting him, respecting the work, respecting the talent, respecting how he approached the ultimate goal of winning. He didn't care whether you liked him. Now, at the end of the day, after you respected him, if you liked him after that, then that was just a bonus. But I got to see from the best player in the world, he didn't care whether you liked him or not. But at the end of the day, you're going to respect him. And like I said, I knew that already going into it. I had already been faced with those type of situation, but just to see it come from him on a whole nother level for the guy who was the most popular person in the world, handle that and set that type of tone was pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you talked about having respect for him as a leader, which I think is overlooked sometimes in leadership. We think sometimes it is a, a contest about, you know, who likes more who. Um, but but ultimately, uh, not only did you have respect for him, but he obviously had respect for you because you became a scout for his for his team uh, in the in, with the Charlotte Hornets. And so after your playing career um, and winning three championships with the Bulls, he ends up hiring you as a scout for the Hornets. Talk about like, were you 
always anticipating going in to being a scout or, or getting in to a front office role? Or was this something that you, you had the opportunity to pursue and had to learn on the job as you were doing it? It was one of those things that when I finished my career, when I decided I was going to stop playing basketball, I sat down at the dining room table with my wife one day and I wrote down all the different things that I wanted to do or pursue after I finished playing. And I had a list and I hit, I actually hit everything that was on that list. And scouting was one of them. TV was one of them. And I didn't have a particular order on how I was going to hit them, but I was able to get into TV because of my relationship, my relationship equity that I had had um, Doris Burke, I knew back when I was at Providence, she went to Providence. That was when she started. She had just started in the TV when I got to Providence as a freshman and her ex-husband at the time was our SID. And so I had already known Doris and Doris helped me to get an opportunity in the TV. So that's where I started. Um, and so, like you said, relate, the relationship equity that you have for people to help you get in, you know, to at least be in front of an opportunity is based on the respect that person has, your character, your integrity. So that's where I started. And then all of a sudden I get a call one day when I'm gonna get ready to go do a Illinois game um, for ESPN at the time I was working for ESPN. I get a phone call and it's M MJ's calling me with Rod Higgins on the speaker. In the, in the office and I me mean, on the speakerphone. And Rod Higgins was the general manager of the Hornets at the time. And so they taught, MJ said, you ready to come work down here? And I was like, yeah. So they talked about um, what they were envisioning, what they wanted me to do, the development and the growth and the process, come down and start off scouting and learn the business. So to get that call was, Again, another moment in life, one of those defining moments where, like you said, here's the best player to ever play the game. Obviously, we had a relationship, we have a friendship, but also to respect my abilities to call me and ask me to come work in his organization. I thought that was, uh, um, you know, amazing and, and just a great feeling. Um, and again, a defining moment for me and my growth and process. So that's kind of how it got to um, the scouting situation. And, you know, obviously I played the game, so I'm evaluating guys all the time. And I had a, I had a basketball development program and AAU teams at the time. So I was evaluating kids for that. So I already had the structure and the blueprint about evaluating scouting. But yes, when I got to the Hornets, Obviously, I learned the game even more. And obviously, there's a different, there's a core scouting approach no matter what level you're looking at. But then there's some nuances and there's some different things that uh, come into play as the levels go up, high school, college, and then professional. So um, obviously, I've learned those things over the past. I think I've been scouting for 15 years now, 14 years now. So, and, it, and it's always evolving. So always evolving and learning. So to answer your question, yes, I, I knew the essence of scouting, the core, but um, I also learned uh, over the past 14, 15 years. And I like what you mentioned earlier about the relationship equity. Uh, so vital just in life in general. Um, and I didn't realize uh, Doris Burke, the third uh, greatest uh, that that enters uh, um, your, your journey. So very, very cool. Uh, in terms of the scouting, I did want to ask you because you had these great experiences in college on championship teams, obviously with some of the best NBA championship teams. Uh, in football, this exists as well, the, the kind of structure within scouting. Uh, and I'm just curious, how did you inject your own experiences into scouting in, in terms of things that you've seen? You, you know, you've been talking about some of the leadership qualities of MJ and Phil Jackson. Um, but, but staying within the realm of maybe like an NBA scouting structure, how do you inject your own experiences when you're evalu evaluating players? Well, you know, it's interesting you ask that because when I came on board, 
you know, in my role when I'm scouting, I add value from being a former NBA player, um, being a former Division One high major basketball player. Um, I add value from seeing what it took to build a championship team in college as well as in the NBA um, and seeing the roles that have to be played and the leadership roles that were displayed in those processes. So, and I've coached grassroots kids to championships um, and I've I have the value of being around the perspective from analyzing from a TV perspective. So I bring a, a bunch of different aspects that not the normal scout has when he's evaluating. So I implement all of those things when I'm evaluating talent. And like I was saying before, I mean, there's a core, there's a core part of evaluating that really doesn't change much. I mean, Talent is talent. Like the first thing you have to have is some talent, right? So, um, but then you have to now figure out what kind of team do you want to have? What are the pieces that you have already to get to that team? What pieces do you need, right? And then, I t yeah, I take, some, I take some of the thought process from when I played. Um, I take some of the thought process of dealing with kids of the day. I take some of the thought process of how, how basketball has evolved, whether you like it or not, the evolution of the game is not the same as when I play. So even though I take some of that thought process, that's not the total thought process because that's not the way the game is being played now. So, and the approach to the level of success and the building the culture is not the same. You know, like a lot of these guys wouldn't have been able to play with MJ. They wouldn't have been able to play on the same court with MJ because of the level of intensity, the level of accountability, and the level of demand. They wouldn't have been able to play with MJ because, you know, the approach, like, the approach now with today's talent has to be a little different. You know, you very, very rarely come across a player with old school, I'll just say old school mentality. Um, so it's a little different. So um, I take all those different experiences in consideration, but ultimately understanding that there's a new style of basketball, there's a new mentality of basketball, the evolution of the game now is not like that. So it's a mixture of all those things to try to make sure I'm evaluating the right player that fits where we're trying to go as an organization. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier when we were chatting about your approach coming into the Bulls and, and being ready to work and, and fulfill your role. And, and as you mentioned, star in your role. Uh, and I think you kind of touched on it just now in, in terms of the coachability. And I think that's something that is, is tough, tougher now than maybe it was 15, 20 years ago. Uh, what is there something that you notice in some of the players that are, are successful nowadays in the league? Because when you're evaluating, everybody has talent. Um, everybody you're looking at has roughly the same talent. Uh, I'm just curious if there's anything uh, intangible that you notice in some of the players that you've seen have success, um, maybe more than others. If it's an intangible, it's probably the hunger from a mentality standpoint um, is probably one of the intangibles. Um, the other intangible is probably the mental approach towards, towards the process of the up and downs, the adversity, the success. And so that hunger and that mentality coming together to be able to withstand those up and downs, those are probably the intangibles, but like I tell people all the time, and I use percentages, right? Like three to 5% of the NBA players will probably have, would, would probably have success no matter what team they were on, right? That's your super elite talent. That's your, uh, that's your all-stars. Those are your franchise guys. Those are just your game changer guys, right? The other 97 to 95% of the NBA players their success 
is going to be based on these things. The right fit, the right fit or system of a team, the right coach who really likes that player's talent, skills, can, can, and is willing to develop and put them in a role for success. And, and the last piece is just the synergy of the organization upstairs and downstairs from a business standpoint. Uh, and then the last thing is players are one injury away or one older veteran away from getting their opportunity on the court and going from not playing to getting paid a hundred million dollars. You know, I mean, I could use many examples, you know, David Lee, David Lee gets hurt at Golden State Warriors. It opens up an opportunity for Draymond Green. Would Draymond Green be Draymond Green if David Lee didn't get hurt? I don't know that. But it opened up a door for an opportunity. So he had the fit of the system. He had an injury of another player open up an opportunity. He had the mentality, the, the intangible of the mentality and the hunger. And he had a coach that was willing to help develop, play, and build confidence and trust in him. And so I'm just using him as an example, but those are the things that come down to whether a player has success or not after you draft him. Right. And I saw this in football too. Uh, the, the situation sometimes can dictate the success or maybe the amount of success that certain players have. Uh, and sometimes it can be just as simple as getting an opportunity at the right time uh, in their development um, or, or the type of coach that's in charge. Uh, so um, I, I, I'm not shocked that the NBA and basketball in general has, has very similar intangibles. Yeah, because I, I was talking to somebody the other day, and this is just from my own experience watching and playing. Coach Lenny Wilkins, Coach Paul Salas, I watched those guys – have players that that weren't high draft picks, players that weren't drafted at all, but ended up having success playing for those coaches and going to other teams and playing more or end up getting big contracts because those coaches had a way of putting those players from their skill and their role into the best opportunity to be successful for the team and for the player. I witnessed that with my, and I'm naming those two guys because those two coaches, veteran coaches, Hall of Fame guys stand out to me for being able to do that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you mentioned earlier about this visual uh, aspect that you bring to the game or, or that you specifically kind of intake the game through. Uh, and so not only were you able to kind of fulfill the scouting checkbox on your on your post basketball playing career but but also the analyst checkbox and and so just talk about how different that is watching a game through a scout size and through an analyst size or, or maybe the similarities that are there yeah the similarities are the evaluation part you know being able to know players tendencies their strengths their weaknesses their skill what they bring to the game right that's the similarities in scouting and doing your job as an analyst. I think the differences are they're two different, they're two different um, analysts is a more of an entertainment, entertainment part of this game, right? And so I, in high school, I took television production classes. You know, I, I was always open to learning other things and broadening my perspective and my scope of abilities and talent for my future. So I took several television production classes to learn the behind the scenes, the behind the camera, as well as in front of the camera. When I got to college, I was uh, asked if I wanted to do, they needed somebody to work on a radio station. So I said, hey, I'll do it. And so I started working on the radio station as a DJ on WDOM 91.3, Providence Radio. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, I was the moon man. So it was like when the sun goes down, the moon comes up. You listen to the moon man on WDOM 91.3. And so it's just funny how I was always taught by my mother how to talk by my mother to build for the long game, 
to build where you have all different types of skills, talents, experiences, exposure. And it's funny how all those things helped when I wrote that list, sitting at the table with my wife, how I was able to tap into everything because of this process, because of this mindset. And so then it leads to me playing for the Bulls. And they used to do a three-on-three tournament in Chicago in the parking lot of the state, out of the arena. And one day uh, they asked me to be the analyst for it. And so I took the opportunity to do that. Fast forward it now, I finished playing. My relationship equity with Doris gets me an opportunity in front of decision makers. They were able to see my skills and it grew from there. And then, and, and the difference is just it's the entertainment part. It's not that much pressure on me as a, as a TV analyst. I show up, I do my job, I do my research. I have fun with the game. When the game is over, how well the players play, the wins and losses don't affect me whatsoever. <laughs> Whereas in scouting, how the players play and the wins and losses affect, you know, us as a collective group. So TV analysts is fun. I enjoy it. Obviously, you have to have communication skills. Um, you have to see the game. You have to visualize. You have to forecast. And you have to have a level of um, some type of entertainment value. And so I think I'm able to do all those things. I've been doing TV for 14, 15 years now. I've been doing TV for 15 years. I was with ESPN for five years. And I've been with uh, Fox Sports for like nine years now. So I've been able to be in the game. So those are the differences. And that's how, um, and those are the similarities. Well, that is, uh, that is really great. And Moon Man. Um, I had no idea. Now, now we know. So uh, I think I got the title for our for our podcast episode. Yeah, yeah, that's a little that's a little secret. That's a little secret nobody knew about Moon Man on the radio station. <laughs> uh, well, Dickie, thank you so much. This was an awesome conversation. Um, I could keep going on and on about intangibles and the great teams that you've been on, but uh, this was wonderful. And I just thank you so much for uh, joining me here today on the highest level. Well, I appreciate you having me on and hopefully what we talked about today can help somebody else from a team leadership or just, just about life, man. So I appreciate the opportunity. No, no doubt. Thank you so much, Dickie.